And with that, welcome you inside this week opening edition of Big Ten Today. Rick Piso, thrilled to be joined by the road warrior himself, <laughs> Howard Griffith, back from the training camp tour. Great to have you back in studio. I know, Howard, we talked after media days. We felt like there was a different vibe with the four West Coast schools coming in. Did it feel the same way when you were on those campuses and even visiting the schools that were here before August 2nd? Yeah, I think one of the things that I take away immediately is just the excitement that's around our programs that are have been here. Some of the places that I've been, there is a different vibe. They feel a lot different. Being at Maryland, there was a different vibe, a different uh, uh, attitude around the team. You think about what Coach Loxley has, has been able to do. He's loose. The team's loose. So I think everybody at this particular Point, more so than any time before, has a very calm and relaxed type of an attitude going into this. I think the unknown is there for everyone. It's yeah. not just the four Big Ten schools who come in trying to figure out how this is going to work. Everybody is in the yeah. same boat. Of course, the four West Coast schools <laughs> have a little bit more travel once you get into conference play. A bit. And at least one of them has a lot more change to deal with than just a new league. Our big story does take us out west, where all four of the league's new additions begin their first seasons in a little bit of flux, but none more so than UCLA. Not just a new conference, but an unexpected head coaching change, a major loss in the coordinator space, and a roster that is drastically different, all helping frame a season that will surely look like none other in the history of Bruins football. It was almost exactly six months ago when then head coach Chip Kelly turned the college football world on its ear by leaving Westwood and leaving millions on the table to become the OC at Ohio State. Of course, just three days later, Bruin legend, longtime assistant to Sean Foster, got his first ever head coaching job at any level, a job that begins in earnest when the Bruins travel to Hawaii for their season opener on August the 31st. Deshaun Foster, who I got to cover as a player, was actually in North Carolina when he got drafted by the Carolina Panthers. I believe that was in 2001. He is a soft-spoken guy, a guy who prefers for his actions more than his words to tell the story. But the players, by all measure, absolutely love him and have bought into what he is trying to sell. Yeah. The issue is, do you have enough pieces to go along with that sell a job to compete inside the toughest conference in the yeah, country. I'd say this. He is soft-spoken, no question about it, when he's not on the football field. When he's on the field, he is into it and really engaged with the players. Has done a really good job. Had a chance to see him this spring. And he does a great job of moving around the field and trying to understand what all is going on that's out there. But they still, they have pieces out there, but they still have a toll order to try to get out and be as competitive as they need to be this year. So you try to think about everything that's gone on in Westwood, and I think Chip Kelly departing was not anything that Martin Jarman, the AD, mm -hmm. or any of the coaches on that staff could have expected, but he wanted to just, in his own words, coach yeah. ball. So the job goes to Deshaun Foster just three days later. It's not as if he needs to change the culture because it's a culture he knows so well, yes. being a longtime running back. But, Howard, I think we can all agree that his job is as hard, if not harder, than any coach leading these new schools into the league. Jed Fish, a first-year guy at Washington, a brand-new roster as well. I would argue that Deshaun's job is the toughest of the four. Yeah, no doubt about it. It's a tough job, but he brought in Eric Bieniemy, who's going to be Smart a move. major help to him, who knows that L.A. area very well since he grew up there. And he's also coached at UCLA. So I think there's some pieces that are in place. I think one of the positive things is he's really opened up his practices and opened up this UCLA to the community. Because it, it had been kind of closed. They just wanted to kind of focus on what was going on. Deshaun Foss has done a tremendous job of the outreach. And I think that's part of what we're not going to see in the wins and loss column. He's really helping the program in many ways. It won't show up there. But this is still a project. This is still, they've got a lot of work to do. And he understands it. it's not an easy job. But I think he's built to be able to take them to where they need to go. I get the sense, too, that this is going to be about fundamentals, and the elementary building blocks, especially yeah. at the beginning. Yes, you have a quarterback in Garbers who has mm -hmm. some experience, but you look at Deshaun Foster's history, the position yeah. he played. He was the running backs coach as well. He was asked at media day, Deshaun, do you expect to run some inside zone, some outside zone? He said, all of that and then some. Yeah. 
I sense offensively they are going to be defined by what they do inside the tackle box. Yeah, I think ultimately you want to be able to play strong defense and be able to run the football. One of the things you go back to looking at them last year, they made huge strides on the defensive side of the ball. Now, they ended up losing their defensive coordinator to the crosstown rival. So they'll have to be able to meet that expectation defensively. Again, seeing them, they're physically, they have the guys there to be able to make things happen. Are they deep? Do they need to continue to develop depth? Yeah, they, but everybody who doesn't need to develop depth. It's just going to be a process, and I think he's going to be okay. And that's where the transfer portal comes in be because when there. you take over in February, when all the change that is going on is you're the guy that's in charge of that, you need ready-made yeah. players. And the transfer portal gives you the ability to have ready-made players at your disposal especially on the defensive end. You, you touched on Dan Lynn, who yeah. leaves UCLA to go to USC. Lincoln Riley has talked about what a coup he believes that is, one of the most highly respected yeah. defensive coordinators in this business. How does it kind of affect a departure like that, especially to your crosstown rival? Does it affect the players that return to this defense and know they have to be a huge key cog with that fundamentally first system? Well, let's think about it this way. One of the reasons uh, that Lincoln Riley went out and got Danton Lynn was the fact that he took the pieces that UCLA had the previous year. It wasn't like they had an influx of talent that came in. He took the same guys that had been on that defense the year, the previous year and really transformed them into one of the best defenses in all of college football. That was his calling card. So now for the next guys have to understand, they have to step up and raise the level because now it's a different style of play that they're going to be looking at. I'm not so willing to say that just because you're out on the West Coast, you can't be physical at the point of attack. I think that's a misnomer. I think we're going to find out that if UCLA can do what they need to do, the fundamentals, it's blocking, it's tackling, being able to stop the run, being able to run the football, that will shorten the games for them and allowing their quarterback to go out and make some plays. They have guys at the skill positions. All these teams do, because there's so many of these guys that are running around. You talk about the length. You talk about just the ability to speed. They have those components that are in place. It's making sure that they're running the right offense. They can put them in a position to be successful. And it's no doubt that there's going to be some growing pains, but the enemy is outstanding. He's coached, you know, one of the best that's ever played that position thus far in his career. Still, uh, he still has a lot of years when you think about that. So I think it's just about buying in and understanding what the expectations and what the identity is ultimately going to be for this team. Well, let's finish there with expectations because Deshaun Foster was asked multiple times at media days, what defines success? Really tough question yeah. for a first-year coach in his situation to answer. Of course, you want to get to the postseason. Mm -hmm. That is goal number one. It's always going to be there. You need to be playing in some type of bowl game. Yeah. But I think putting a wins or losses total is almost – unfair, yeah. not just for any program, but specifically for UCLA this year. How do you think at the end of it, Deshaun will define whether 2024 was a success or not? I think one of the things he has to look at is the team competing for four quarters, right? Mm. That is a big part of what they need to get to. And I'm not saying they, they didn't do that last year, but that's how you can you know, really identify what's happening in the culture of your program. Are they playing hard all the time? What's happening with the mental mistakes? Now, we don't get a chance to see that so often because we don't get the grades of the players, but you see when big plays are given up on the defensive side. That kind of stands out, so you know that probably a, a mental mistake was made. So if you can limit those mental mistakes, right, you're playing hard all the time, everything else will take care of itself. It's going to be tough, but the challenge is making sure that everyone's buying into the same system and giving their all. How come you're not on the land yet on your way to Westwood? You didn't get the L.A. call? I didn't get the L.A. call. They wanted to send Coach Donardo out there. You're not a there. beach guy? Yeah, Donardo's well, a beach listen, guy. I, I want to be out on the beach, but hey, not this time. Donardo's a tennis guy, <laughs> not a beach guy. Uh, yes, our training camp tour has made its way to the idyllic UCLA campus for a visit with Coach Deshaun Foster and the Bruins. You can see video from UCLA practice, exclusive interviews, and expert analysis. Wait, should I change that? You said it was Jerry, right? Well, yeah, Yogi's out there as well, Fair so enough. it's expert. It's the debut airing of our football training camp UCLA show, Monday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Big Ten today, the AP preseason poll released just a few moments ago, hot off the presses, and the Big Ten has a very big presence. <laughs> two teams inside the top three with Ohio State and Oregon, two more inside the top ten, Penn State at eight, Michigan at nine, and two more inside the top 25 with one of the newcomers in USC and the defending West Division champion Iowa Hawkeyes, of course, 
There will be no West Division or divisions of any kind in 2024. And with a focus on USC, we look at Lincoln Riley, only one active coach with at least 75 games as a head man under his belt, has a higher winning percentage than Riley, and that's Kirby Smart, who seemingly has Georgia in the national title race every season. In fact, Smart and Riley, the only coaches with these specific qualifications to have won at least 80% of their games. Welcome you back inside our Big Ten Today studio, Rick Pizzo, Howard Griffith. I know that's the past, and it doesn't necessarily have a huge effect on the current season that USC will undertake in 2024. Really tough opener against LSU. But when you have a coach that comes in with those kinds of credentials, there's no question. It makes a massive difference. It makes a huge difference. You know what the expectations are going to be and where they're trying to get to. So those expectations have been laid out. They understand what it needs to do to be able to get to the next level. And getting to the next level is really about winning championships when you're at USC. So I think you go back to the spring. Actually, you go back to last year as they were starting to prepare uh, for the bowl game. They had a lot of guys that sat out. Lincoln Riley has been on record talking about this was probably some of the most productive practices that he could have had and expected out of his team. When you think about having a, a generational talent like Caleb Williams at the quarterback position, he's talked a lot about that. Sometimes that can really stifle the offense from a standpoint of maybe he doesn't have to go through all the reads because he's so athletic, is so gifted, and can do so many things that he can get outside of the system. Now he has a young man, a quarterback, that wants to play within, inside the system and has been in the system, understands it. So it may look a lot different than what we are accustomed to seeing these big explosive plays when quarterbacks are getting out of the pocket. So he thinks this is a team that really had an opportunity to gain its identity, but that happened during their bowl preparation. Something that he wasn't really expecting, but probably gives them a leg up as they move in the training camp. A really impressive bowl performance by Miller Moss. I believe six total yeah. touchdowns. And I asked Lincoln Riley about something that's being termed as the post-Caleb Williams era at USC. And he said, no disrespect, but I don't like that term because mm -hmm. it takes away from what we were as an offense. We weren't one player. Yeah. Caleb was a phenomenal player, but he didn't just define our philosophy. Our philosophy yeah. is surrounded by whatever 11 guys mm -hmm. are on the field at one time. And I think that's really important to point out. So Moss returns. Zachariah Branch returns. Returns being the key word yeah. because he's a <laughs> dynamic return man. But Howard... For those who haven't seen this young man play football, yeah. he is going to be utilized, I think, a lot more in the offense this year after getting his feet wet as mainly a return man yeah. in 2023. He may be the most dynamic player in college football. And that's when you talk about being able to get prepared. Now, all of a sudden, you can get him into your offense. You can move him all over the field. He really changes really some of the keys for a defensive standpoint because you don't want to just have him single covered. If he gets in space and he's able to get behind people, he's going to make some big plays. So you have to also adjust your defense, and it has to become more of a catch-all. The other interesting thing is we talk about all the technology that's going to come into play iPads on the sidelines, communication uh, within the helmet for the quarterback. And it's whichever. about time, by the way, yeah. with the helmet communication. Exactly, and whichever player is designated on the defense, we expect that for the most part to be at the linebacker position. But now it really turns into a true cat and mouse game. How quickly can you make adjustments? It's just not about halftime. It's now, guys, get that information right now. And you say, okay, well, they, had, they did this at this particular point. They adjusted to our formation that way. You're just so much quicker to be able to get that information in Miller that I think that'll give that team a lot of chances to have those explosive plays that they want. I don't think there are a lot of questions surrounding this offense after Miller Moss's bowl game yeah. performance because now you feel like you have a quarterback that has the keys mm -hmm. to a really nice car. The questions are obviously on the other side of the yeah. ball. And this defense also played by far its most, I would say, intense game in that bowl game. They tackled mm -hmm. better. They went after the football better. But Lincoln Riley knew he needed to address the defense. So he goes cross town. We mentioned Dan Lynn. It's a significant departure for UCLA and an arguably more significant addition yeah. for USC. You've been in these spots. You've watched coordinator changes. How much of a difference can a defensive coordinator make in year one joining a new program? Well, we've, we've seen it already, right? We've seen what he did at UCLA. 
And by the way, Rick, he was running 110, so they're about nine years old when he's running around with the Broncos, his dad and our teammates Love there. Love that. So what I think it's, it's unbelievable to, to see where he has grown. And, and to be truthful, he spent a lot of time with Rex Ryan as he was developing as a defense coordinator while he was still in college. You've got to learn from. So he really has this defensive uh, philosophy and it's set in stone. But I think it's about demanding demanding the expectations, right? So you take a team like USC that you know traditionally has been explosive. You know what they can do on the defense, offensive side of the football. Now can you get those guys defensively? They don't want to be the weak link. Nobody wants to, and that's not to say that the players last year were in a situation where we could just go out and do what we needed to do. Everybody wants to play at their very best. But the guy at the front of the room can really dictate that, right? The message that he sends. sends. Sometimes simpler or, or, you know, some of the things that you do when you simplify some things really pays dividends. There's no question. USC is not falling off the recruiting map at all. So they have the talent that's there. It's about making sure they're in the right place to be able to take advantage of it. I'm glad you bring up recruiting because Dan comes in and he can show these recruits we have the chance to be the group that changes how people think of USC, mm -hmm. that they don't just think of USC as, as an offense first team and the yeah. defense has to be good enough. He wants the defense to be better than good enough. I do want to touch on the schedule because yeah. USC better come out of the gates mm -hmm. strong. They cannot afford a slow start on either side of the ball. I mentioned the Labor Day Sunday opener against LSU. Yeah. You also have a road trip to Michigan. You have mm -hmm. Penn State, you have Wisconsin. Those are among the first six games of your schedule in your first year inside the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. You cannot afford to get behind the eight ball. And with that schedule, if you don't play your best, you will be exactly at that point. When people talk about playing complementary football, we're going to find out early if they can play that complementary football, right? And defense, that travels. you got to be able to take that anywhere you want to. And we talk about it. It's such a cliche. We want to shut down and run. Yeah, you do. You want to try to make teams as one-dimensional as possible. But there are going to be some opportunities for this defense. They're going to have to really deal, dig their heels in and really make some plays because offensively, Although they had the outstanding performance in the bowl game, there's still got to be some, some learning curves on that side of the ball. So which units are going to be ahead? It'll be fascinating to get Coach DiNardo and Yogi's take uh, tomorrow, I believe, to find out just how they feel about this defense. Yeah, they'll be there on Tuesday. And, of course, we'll bring you the USC football training camp tour show as well later on Tuesday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Should be a fascinating year in L.A. Much more on that. We will hear from Lincoln Riley, hear from select players. I'm assuming Danton Lynn yeah. as well. <laughs> we bring you practice video. The USC football training camp tour show comes your way. Debut airing Tuesday, 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 Pacific.